So let us get started. Started with the fluff. This is Barely Furcasting, featuring Tabin, an Injured Nerves audio production. Well, hello and welcome to the Barely Forecasting featuring Tabin. I am Barely Normal and you are? My name is Tabin. I'm a pup bark bark. And thank you for spending some time with us today in the neighborhood, in the furry hood. The furry hood. It's a beautiful day in the furry hood. A beautiful day for a furry. Would you be mine? I would Could be yours. Could you be mine? Bark bark. Yes. Anyway, I don't know why I said that. Probably because I'm on some pretty heavy painkillers right now. Oh, <laughs> wow. And why are you on pretty heavy painkillers right now? So Wednesday morning, I got out of bed and my back was a little sore. And I went to stand up and my back just said, nope, you're not standing up. Oh. And down I went. Oh. It was like somebody had stuck a hot dagger into my spine. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was not good. That is not good. <laughs> That's not good. Uh, my back just seized up. And there is no way I was going to stand up. So I am laying on the floor, screaming in pain. The husband gets up and looks at me like, what's wrong? (laughs) (laughs) Those okay, those are the first words. And I said, well, I'm in a lot of pain as I'm screaming. And he's like, don't scream so loud. The windows are open. You'll wake the neighbors. (laughs) (laughs) You have the best husband. I know, right? So what does he do? He takes a pair of socks out of his drawer and says, here, chew on this so you don't make the screams outside. Oh, my cow. (laughs) Really? Yeah, he and was when, the best. And when he listens to this, I'm going to get in trouble for telling that story on the air. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll hope he never has to listen to it. I guess. I guess. So I went to the I went to the doctor virtually, much like we're doing here. Uh-huh. And the doctor says, "Well, can you stand up and bend over?" It's like, no, no, I can't do that. So they prescribed me some uh, pretty heavy painkillers, and uh, so I took those, and it's made it better. Well, that's good. And and you don't scream when you have to chew on a I sock. Don't, I don't have to chew on a sock. No. That's so great. So do we know what caused it or anything? I can tell you what it is. It's the gray muzz. Oh, oh. Mm-hmm. The, the grayness has caused things to start not being as young as they were. The back so, is now achieving the, the gray muzzleness. Well, I hope that gets better. I hope so too. I mean, it's better today on a scale of one to 10. It's about a five today. Yesterday, it was a 10. Oh, geez. When the doc asked one to 10, if uh, 10 being the absolute worst pain ever, what would you say you're at? I said, probably a 12. Oh, no, that, that's <laughs> that's no good. <laughs> so let's move along. The other day, I turned on Spaceballs, the movie. Oh, wow. How exciting was that? It was like the 20th time I watched it. And, you know, it, it never gets old. Well, well, it does get old because it's 25 it's, years old. But Yeah, uh, and you've seen it 20 times. <laughs> yeah, and uh, a lot of the people that are in it are no longer on the planet. So oh, that's a sad thing. You but know, you watched point. it and that's a happy thing. That is, yeah. I mean, uh, John Candy as the Mog, you know, half man, half dog. He's his right. own best friend. He no, is. <laughs> by the name of Barf. That's right. And then there's that scene where they're flying along and someone says, what's your name? And he says, Barf. And it's like, not here. I don't know. Okay. What's your name? Barf. What's your full name? Barfolomew. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> What have you been watching? Let's see. What have I been watching? So I finished the season two of the Goldbergs. You know, I'd been watching that and it's mm-hmm. still awesome. The unfortunate thing is they don't have season three through however many seasons they have on disc or on anything like I've been wanting, have been watching hmm. it. And so it, they do have it on Hulu. But right. the problem is the device that I have Netflix and everything, the CD, DVD player and everything on does not support Hulu anymore. And it turns out that most of these devices don't support Hulu anymore. And so I don't exactly know how I'm going to watch the other seasons of the Goldbergs. But you have a Hulu subscription, right? I have a Hulu subscription, but that means I can only watch it on my computer. Right. But that means me and my husband can't sit on the couch and watch. I mean, so that's my conundrum there with that. I'm going to have a conundrum solvination. Solvination? I'm going to have a conundrum solvination. I love solvinations. So if you hook up your your computer to the television and use the television as your computer's monitor. That's right. You can do that. I'll, yeah. I, I think I've done that before with the particular um, laptop I have. So that might work. It's a good idea. Conundrum solved. Conundrum solvinatedized. <laughs> Other than that, I rotate the shows around. And since I just finished a season of Goldberg's on to the next thing. And so we started the next season of Community. Have you heard that? I have heard of that. I watched, I think I watched the first season and I started the second. Up, up to this point, it's pretty good. 
Yeah. So this is the third season we're on and we were a little disappointed with it. Like you're right. I got through the second half of the second season. It's like awesome and everything. But then like the last half ish of the second season, so bad in my humble Mm. opinion. But so we thought we'd give it another chance again and watch the first two episodes. So bad. But uh, (laughs) watch the third episode today and it's a little bit better. It's Mm -hmm. not. It's a little bit better. So I'll give another chance. Okay. (laughs) So we'll see how that goes. And then I I also watched another episode of F is for Family. And it's still, there are words that this pup does not understand still, but it's still entertaining anyway. So we'll just continue going with that and see how that goes. I'm guessing by the end of the season of F is for Family, you will have figured out what those words mean just by context. Ooh, context (laughs) clues. I'm a smart pup. That's exciting. Well, you know what time it is. What time is it? It is time for five minute furs for fun. I'm going to post the link. And that's kind of exciting because there's been a few furs that tried last week. Of course, you remember, and a few of them couldn't do it because, well, you can't do this on a phone. Ten minutes later. Ten minutes went by and nobody uh, nobody signed in. So maybe this was a bad idea. What do you think, Taven? Should we keep trying to do this or what do you well, think? Well, I no. thought it seemed like a good idea that you had. Furs are saying they, they want to do it and stuff. And it, it just sounded like a good way to just like talk to other furs and stuff. But apparently they don't like us. I don't know. I'm, I don't know. So. I'm scary pup. Well, I guess if you're out there in podcast land listening to us and you think this is a good idea to try and get some other furs on to come and chat with us for a couple of minutes, you know, let us know an email and on the chat and let us know if that's something you want to keep doing. If not, we're just going to, we're just going to drop this segment and move on to other things, I guess. (laughs) So with that, let us get to our guest and our guest today is Rukas. Very oh, excited. I'm so excited. Wait, wait, wait. She's a very popular and uh, prolific writer and artist in artist. the furry community. I love her art so much. And uh, the few books of her I've read are, have been so great. I'm really looking forward to talking to her. All right. Well, joining us today is Rukas. Yay, Rukas. Hello. A very famous furry author in the furry fandom. Thank you so much for joining us today, Rukas. You're very welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Very famous. When did that happen? (laughs) (laughs) Just now, maybe? (laughs) You know, we go to cons and your booth is always swarmed with people every time we're there. So. Oh, man, I miss those days. I don't know if you remember me, but every single con I go to that you're at, I buy things from you. I have to, but I do so much that I forget what I've already got from you. Yes, I think I do recall you now. Yeah, I I remember your name. I'm I'm pretty good with names. I'm not as good with faces. Well, I am a pup. Big blue puppy. And (laughs) great. You did a little commercial with us for one of the... Oh, okay, yes. You were you were in suit then, right? Well, I'm just a puppy, so I don't know what this... I only wear suits to like fancy dinners and stuff, but I don't get invited <laughs> to many fancy dinners, so I really never wear a suit. So if you saw me in suit, then that meant I must have been on my way to a fancy dinner, and that's just exciting. <laughs> All right, Tabin. Well, do you have some questions for Rukas? I do. I have some questions for you. Would you like to answer some questions from me, Rukas? Absolutely. Go for it. I am going to go for it. Not a go for like the mousy type thing, but go for... Okay, I'll stop that. That was a bad joke that I just did. So let me ask you, you're a writer and an artist. I know because I bought both things from you. And which came first, Rukas the writer or Rukas the artist? I was definitely doing art first when I was a little kid, according to my mom anyway. And I started writing at a really young age too, apparently, but I'm pretty sure the art beat it out. I think I was I was doing art at like two and I started writing when I was like six or something later. I was a profuse storyteller at the very least. My mom has told me that. So So then they go, they go paw and paw, of course. Yeah, there you go. Did you continue just writing the same amount? The artistry kind of just stayed the same and then the writing snowballed or did it just kind of come full force? They kind of, they've definitely like fluctuated over the course of my life. Um, I was definitely like way more into art for most of my really young life, like 10 and under. I started writing these dumb little sci-fi novels when I was like, I think I started at like 12. I was writing those pretty profusely throughout like my teenage years. That's where the name Rukus comes from. It's an alien character actually made up when I was like 13. (laughs) 
<laughs> but I actually dropped out of writing for a long time when I hit college. I was focusing more on art. Hmm. I was trying to, you know, make a career out of it, you know, into my early 20s. And I kind of got back into writing after I started doing script writing for Red Lantern and for for cruelty and unconditional. I realized that I had more stories I wanted to tell from Red Lantern. So I just kind of stepped back into doing it for fun. And I started writing, I think Heretic was the book that it was like a, a one-off short story that became a book. And then Fur Planet approached me and was like, hey, you could turn this into a book. And so suddenly I was writing again. That's awesome. That's awesome. So you just mentioned Heretic and Red Lantern and cruelty. Mm -hmm. I have in front of me, I think it was TFF. I don't remember, but um, one recent con, I bought remastered, uh, cruelty remastered mastered in yeah. color from you and I'm looking mm -hmm. at it right now and it's so exciting because there you are right there and I'm looking anyway I honestly haven't read I've read part of it and I think I got distracted and I haven't finished it but I hear it's sad because I'm a sensitive pup and do I need to have like lots of issues and things? Um, so I would definitely say that Red Lantern leans far more towards being um, a tragedy. Cruelty and Unconditional are have a, a pretty happy outcome. I think you'll be happy. There are parts of it that are a little sad. You know, it deals with like real life issues and stuff. So, but I think you're pretty safe. Pretty on that safe. one. Yeah. Okay. Good. No, that's good to know. I, I always like going into it knowing how much I'm going to cry or not. So <laughs> I have had people tell me cruelty and unconditional have made them cry, but I've I've never heard like it was a bad cry. It was a okay. good cry. Oh, I like good cries. Okay. Yeah. I can do it. I'm looking forward to finishing that then. And then Heretic, I so I haven't read many novels or, or things at all. In fact, some of the only furry stuff I've read as far as like novels go is from you and Kyle Gold. So Heretic, was my the first book of yours I read really great I loved it so much and then I Aww. read your legacy both the uh, dawn and dusk if you made it through legacy you'll be fine on cruelty <laughs> oh, <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> legacy uh, is definitely my roughest book so okay. and by that I mean like you know the most tragic <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I did, I did cry a little bit during um, Legacy, but really loved it. It was really great overall. Now, I know you've also written the Off the Beaten Path. Mm -hmm. I have not read that yet. So what would you, given now what you know about me, what would you say about my about that, how it relates to your other books and, you know, that kind of genre and everything? How do they relate? Well, first off, again, if you made it through Legacy, you've, you've made it through the, I would say, the, the most like emotional book series. In, in Red Lantern. You know, Legacy is a, is really a tragedy and it is intended to be. Off the Beaten Path has tragic elements. There is character death. You know, there are uh, characters dealing with like classism, speciesism, homophobia, things like that. You know, the themes that are in most of my books. But all of that was in Legacy as well. A lot of it's in Cruelty and Unconditional. So I think you're pretty safe to read Off the Beaten Path. It's hard to say, I just wrote a new book series, Kindred, that hasn't been released yet. But until I wrote Kindred, Off the Beaten Path was my favorite book series that I've worked on. It's it's a good, uh, like, you know, gateway to the series for a lot of people I know started with Off the Beaten Path. So I'd recommend it. <laughs> you can self-recommend, you know. You, you can, you can. It won't destroy you. Okay. <laughs> I have a lot of fluff and I don't want this fluff to be destroyed. Uh, <laughs> so could you tell, uh, well, me and our four um, listen, we might have five listeners now. No, I don't know. But for our at least four listeners, what can you say about the storyline to Off the Beaten Path? Off the Beaten Path is a story primarily about revenge. It's a, it's a story about a young woman who faces something very, something terrible happens to her. She basically has to choose over the course of the story whether or not this, this drive that she has for justice is worth what she's losing in the process, both in friendships and people that she loves and in personal cost to, to herself, inner mm -hmm. peace, basically. It's also a story, as most of my stories are, about characters who are alienated by the world, most of the time because of things about themselves that are, in, you know, intrinsic to who they are. Uh, you know, things like sexuality and, and things like ethnicity to a certain extent, Spe in this case it would be species. Basically, uh, most of my books are about people who are from, like, communities that are being persecuted or communities that are 
facing a lot of difficulties in the society that they find themselves in, whether it's class or, or what have you, and banding together. In this case, it's a question of how long and how hard she wants to fight and where she wants to take that fight to. Hmm. Um, like what, what her end goal is, what she's hoping to get you know, out of her, her journey and her struggle. It's also historical fiction, just in case folks here aren't aware. Most of my books, uh, other than Cruelty and Unconditional, are set in early 19th century, late 18th century. It's like an alternate version of the world. It's not really like modern struggles, but I think uh, there's a lot of elements of it that obviously correspond to modern struggles. So It sounds powerful too. I hope so. I hope. <laughs> so you have those three novels and you're coming out with a fourth. Is it a series or just a single book? Well, as usual, as usual, I overwrote. Even Off the Beaten Path was supposed to be one novel. Legacy was supposed to be one novel. Kindred was supposed to be one novel. It's going to be two, Kindred North and Kindred South. And that's just following the characters from one area of the continent to the other. As usual, it's a tale about a journey. I seem to have found my groove there. Most of my stories are about characters going from point A to point B. But that's okay. <laughs> I like writing it and people seem to like reading it. So No, it's um what I've, I mean, as I say, what I've read from you. And again, this is coming from a pup that doesn't read much, but from what I've read, um, I think it's really great. So I think you're right. You do a really good job with that. Between you and I and the four or five listeners, I don't read as much as I should either. Where do you find the time, man? I got to start listening to audiobooks. The most that I read of anything else would, would definitely be Kyle Gold, obviously, but within this community anyway. We had Kyle Gold on the show just recently. It was great having him on and, and it was great talking to him about working with you and everything and uh, how he has some audio books and stuff. So that does sound like some good things to listen to. Um, so what is it like collaborating with him? I mean, he's, he was a really great guy. It's wonderful. I've collaborated with a number of people over the years and, you know, it can be difficult. Your vision might bump up against your partner's vision. I always make sure when I'm going to be illustrating for somebody that I really deep dive into the world. And, you know, obviously I I read the book usually multiple times. I try to talk to the author about the characters. Kyle is great in that he is both willing to give you all the details, but also extremely receptive to your ideas. He's also been helping me edit my books lately, and he's a wonderful editor as well. So, you know, it goes both ways. I love to hear his ideas. I think he doesn't mind mine. So that's key, really, because... You know, if you put your heads together, you're you're going to come up with more cohesive illustrations for a book. So yeah, that was uh, one of the things he was talking about. Just in general, when he's uh, looking for an artist, he likes having the artist like read the actual story. You'd be amazed. Some people unfortunately feel that they don't have to, and you know, to each their own. But I I just feel like it really helps me know what the author wants. And I want the author to be happy more than anything else. And I want the readers to feel like the illustrations correspond to what they're reading. I've, I've read books with illustrations that were just like, was the artist like even told what they were illustrating here? So it's always unfortunate when that happens. Kyle and I like just communicate well. We've been working together for a long time. I kind of went from being like a huge fangirl of his stuff into working for him. So I, I think part of the reason it works out so well is because I am was and continue to be so happy to work for him. You got to enjoy your job to be good at it, in my opinion. And also being that involved, you know, I imagine you feel like you're, I mean, you're really part of the process. Especially in the furry community, because it's such a small community, you really feel like you're part of that story. And people will come up to me and talk to me about Kyle Gold books. And I'm just like, wow, this isn't my book. <laughs> but I mean, it is my book in a way, you know, I'm, I was involved in the creation of it. It's really cool to really feel like part of a team on something. I mean, obviously, they are ultimately his books. It's, mm -hmm. it's like a little nerd dream. So of your books, do you have a favorite book or favorite series? That's hard. I can definitely say, and this is unfortunate because most people haven't gotten to read it yet. I enjoyed writing Kindred probably more than any other book, partially because it was my pandemic book. It's the book I've been writing during quarantine. It was such an involved process with the fans because this is the first book that I've ever beta released on my Patreon. So as I was releasing chapters, like I was doing like maybe three or four edits for a chapter and just throwing it out there to the masses. And, you know, the book was in 
complete and there were still elements of the plot that could change and I'm still even now in the process of making art for it. I got so much feedback and so much involvement from the people who are ultimately going to enjoy the book along the way. It was just wonderful. I actually did a final reading of the, the last couple of chapters. No one had seen them yet, so they didn't know how the book was going to end. I did a reading of it on a stream live. It was amazing. Like, it was probably like the best experience I've ever had with my fans. They got to see the ending of a story like live with me there, and I got to see their reaction and find out if I'd screwed it up. It was so great. I actually did start crying at one point. <laughs> live <laughs> so I, I probably would too so the drawing um you mentioned you started drawing when you were four was it furry from the beginning or how did that start i will say this i didn't know about the furry community like at all until i was about 23 i know that seems unthinkable but you know i was born in 84 i didn't have internet really at all until i was like 18 uh, we lived very rural i got my first computer my first year of college and i was really just kind of starting to discover the internet when I was hitting adulthood. I was always very into fantasy. I was always very into animal characters. I had personas as a kid. I just didn't realize that's what they were. I had like a flying squirrel character. I used to pretend to be a unicorn with my brother in the yard. So I, I don't know when I became a furry exactly, but I've always loved animals and I've always loved intelligent animals and animal people and stuff. I just didn't really know what it was until much later in life. Yeah, yeah. So these characters that you had drawn um, in, in the past then, did any of them kind of shape the characters in some of your books, do you think? I'm sure they did. Most of the characters that I drew as a kid were like dragons and monsters. I was really, I was really, really into like fantasy beasts and stuff as a kid. I didn't start doing like intelligent, like really uh, characters with like backstories, whatever you want to call it, until I was a teenager and I started writing sci-fi. One of those characters was Rukus. You know, that's where I got the name from. It was in like an alien character. And I would say he did kind of segue into Grace and Reed. I don't know if you know the character, He's the privateer. Oh, yeah. He's in Red Lantern. He's in Off the Beaten Path. And he's in Kindred. Uh, he has a big part in Kindred, actually. But yeah, you know, he's your he's your typical swashbuckling, snarky wolf privateer. He doesn't like to be called a pirate. But yeah, there's definitely a lot of Rukus in there. Probably other characters that I can't recall. <laughs> you had a lot of them. There was a captain character in my sci-fi who definitely became part of Luther later. Amongst all your characters that you can recall, do you have a fit in your books? Do you have a favorite? Oh man, I don't know. <laughs> That's way too hard. Luther is the one that like most people know me for. There's a lot about that character that I always enjoy writing him. I have a number of characters that have like a little bit more of me in them, but I don't actually necessarily like those characters. <laughs> Uh, I tend to like a lot of characters that have a lot less of me in them. Finnegan from Kindred is uh, definitely a recent favorite of mine. It'll be coming out probably in like early August or something, okay. I hope. I, I hope that you'll all get to know the characters in that. And... I'm sure we will. Uh, what makes a good story in your mind? I can't say like what makes a good story overall. What I enjoy personally are stories with characters that have goals and motivations that are uh, well laid out that I can understand, uh, characters who are well-rounded and have flaws. I think a flawed character is misunderstood, like the idea of a flawed character is misunderstood. A lot of modern fiction has characters that have flaws that like aren't really flaws. There are things that are outside their control. Hmm. Um, I like characters that make mistakes. I like characters that have skeletons in their closet and dark secrets. And part of obviously uh, like going, I mean, well, I was saying before how characters go from like point A to point B in my stories, but point A and point B is not necessarily just the place. It's also who was this character when the book began, who is this character by the end of the book. So the journey is is inward as well as, you know, obviously they're going going from one place to another. I just immediately think of Kaigar in, um, did I pronounce that right? In Legacy. Kadar is definitely one of my most flawed characters. I love him. Oh, why am I forgetting his name? What's his name? I don't know. Asan? Yes, Asan is, you did so, so good with him. I love him so much. He's a little ragey. He's cute, cute little uh, cin cinnamon roll with some rage issues. Yeah. I assume you reread your books and your passages several times to make sure that, it, that yeah, you're- So many times. Through all this process, how long does it take you to actually write one of your novels? It really depends. In the beginning, I ironically, art is like this for me too. The earlier on I was, into doing this as a career, the less time it took me to like 
create a piece of art or to write a novel. Now it takes me longer than it than it ever did. Kindred, I finished over the course of probably about nine months, whereas, you know, Legacy took like two years. But the difference is that I was doing like only that. I was, I was pretty much, I was devoting like 60 to 70 hours a week just to writing and, and editing while I was working there. Whereas Legacy was spaced out over a long period of time and I was doing I was finishing Conviction at that point. I was doing a lot of other stuff. So it's really hard to say. Heretic I wrote in like three and a half months. Oh, wow. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, I, I didn't know what I was doing at the time. So I, I just kind of pumped this thing out and I barely edited it. And I had so many issues. It does to this day. Like I can't even go back and reread the, the old copies of Heretic because they have so many problems. <laughs> but I love it so much. So You might have one of the newer versions. We got some editors on the case eventually, but it needed it. So quick question about that. So I would say then that first draft probably reads more like what we would call fan fiction these days. Do, <laughs> if that. I mean, right? Yeah. So yeah. do people send you fan fiction with your, own, with your characters in it? People do. I would love to read more fan fiction from my series. There's um, a Apparently, a, a number of people writing fan fiction from Red Lantern. I have a fan who's written more like word count for Red Lantern than I have. He has a oh, whole wow. like expanded novel series, his own characters in it. It's crazy. It's really cool. I have to kind of hold back from reading fan fiction because there is that fear that something that I read from it might end up getting like integrated into the actual world. Oh, and man. I just, I don't want there to be any, any issues with that. It's, it's amazing how confused I get by my own lore in my head. Like <laughs> I, I have fans that know my lore, like places and dates and names better than I do. And then they talk to you and you're like, I, 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 I don't, don't, I don't who know. Who are you yeah. talking about? <laughs> I have I have two different um, historians, I guess you could call it, who I occasionally contact while I'm writing to be like, oh, wow. hey, so Dude. I'm doing I'm doing a scene in this town in Amoresca, and I need to make sure that it doesn't contradict anything that I previously stated in my world. They'll they'll like go through and be like, no, nah, you're good, or oh well, actually, there's this Delta region that you mentioned previously, and I'm like, oh, thank you, all right, you helped me. Catch there's this one ship <laughs> off the coast of wherever that I think had a character that yeah, no, that's <laughs> that's very useful. Unfortunately, I made a big mistake in Kindred. One of the main two characters, like the main two leads is named Finnegan, and he has a different last name, but there's another Finnegan in Red Lantern that I had forgotten about. Uh -oh. um, I mean, I remembered that he existed, but I'd forgotten that his name was Finnegan. And obviously it's completely realistic for there to be two characters with the same name in a, in a setting, but it's a little confusing for the fans. So now when they're referencing, they're like, which Finnegan? And it's like, okay, the, the one who isn't dead. <laughs> the other Finnegan is like, is deceased, so... Yeah, you, of course, illustrate your own books. And which do you think is more fun, the writing or the illustrating? Because you, you started off, what was it, four years before you started writing? I don't know exactly how many years it was. I was probably writing side stuff. But yeah, definitely four or five years before I... Oh, that's my dog hacking, like I said he would. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you hear hacking, it's my dog, I promise. Anyway, um, you better leave this in the pod there, barely. The nice thing about doing both, um, it is a bit of a time thief. Like, I feel like my art could be a little more progressed, a little for lack of a better word, better right now if I if I wasn't spending so much time writing. But it also helps me avoid burnout. So I enjoy both. Sometimes I'm just fed up with writing. And yeah. you know, after like after I finished Kindred, I was like, okay, gh, you know, it's a 230k <laughs> words. I'm I'm ready to get back into art. And now, you know, I've been doing art for two months and I'm like, man, I want to I want to write again. So they complement so, each other in more yeah. ways. And, yeah. yeah, they help they help me like, you know, freshen things up from time to time and, and and not get stuck in a rut. Obviously, other than being on a small time podcast like ours, what's something that's kind of fun for you being a well-known author in the fandom? Have you like got any weird stories about being recognized in odd places outside of the fandom? I actually do have one. Okay. <laughs> that's really it's really local actually, which is weird. Um, obviously, you get recognized at conventions and stuff a lot. I tend to hide my badge when I'm at conventions, but I was at a, um, a restaurant in my area, like a place that's like five minutes from where I live. The server came up, took our order, and 
he like hesitated at our table for a couple of minutes and I didn't notice anything at the time. But when he came back with like our drinks, I noticed on his, he had like one of those little, you know, notepads that they used to write stuff down on the back of it. A lot of people put like stickers or whatever. Yeah. He had mm -hmm. a con badge. That, oh. had, that had a character on it. I don't think most people would have known what it was. It was very unobtrusive. But I immediately, I was like, oh, that's a con badge. And I just, you know, pointed it. And he was basically like, oh, all right. I was wondering. <laughs> I, I recognized your face from, I've posted like maybe two pictures of myself ever. But he was like, are you Rukas? <laughs> and, and I was like, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh... I was just, I was hoping to be like, hey, fellow furry without, you know, him actually knowing who I was. But, yeah. <laughs> but he was so nice. And he chatted with us throughout the, the dinner. And apparently he called his girlfriend to be like, you know, Rukas is here. And he had me sign something for him. It was it was Aww. weird. Um, You know, this is such like a small fandom i never really expected i'd have a moment like that but it no. was it was it was nice well and you know new york has um it has a pretty good uh fandom base oh, so. i'm from i'm originally from new york i spent most of my uh i grew up in new york and i went to college in new york but right now i'm in south carolina actually oh really okay yeah yeah, yeah. i moved down here about uh, eight eight years ago, something like that, basically because New York was, was too expensive. That, that experience in the restaurant, that was in South Carolina? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. so yeah, and that is very surprising. <laughs> yeah, it's it's in this, yeah, I'm in a pretty rural area too, so. At least he didn't become a stalker and it's like watching. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. That'd be even worse. <laughs> no, he was very nice, very sweet. So do you have any tips for budding furry artists or authors? Um, well, obviously right now is a really hard time to be a self-employed anything, really. If you have a very well-established, like, digital portfolio and you can work digitally now now is an okay time pre all of this my advice would have been different but right now the, the main thing that i'll say won't be like career wise just skill set wise the nice thing about being an artist being an author is it's a skill set you can refine your entire life and there is no like one starting point uh, I, I know artists and, and authors who've gotten started in their later years. I know artists and authors who've gotten started at 15, 16, and really like made a successful go of it. It's also something that you can start and stop while you're, while you're uh, going to school, while you're yeah. working a, a different kind of job. I worked since I was 14 on farms. I did not just go straight from, I, I did go to college. I worked on refining my craft while I was in college, but I didn't go straight from college into doing this for a living. I worked for almost five years doing manual labor and retail and again working on um, farms and like lawn and garden places and stuff like that it took some time to build myself to the point where, where I could do this, you know, as a career. But there's a lot of people who are happy just keeping this as a hobby or as like a side hustle or even who want to do this, believe that they want to do this as a career and then they do it as a career and they find that it kind of ruins their enjoyment of it. Um, so they go back to just doing it as a hobby. And the, the wonderful thing about being an artist and being an author is it is so flexible. It's a skill set that provided you, you know, keep it up and you don't even ha you don't have to be a monk about it provided you are doing it occasionally and and learning new things occasionally you'll have that skill set for the rest of your life and you can use it when you choose when it's you know a good time in your life when you think now's the time that I want to make this a career or you can keep it as just a thing that you enjoy don't feel pressured especially not right now don't feel pressured that this has to be a career if you want to make a career of it just make sure that you're well set up at that point to do so be prepared to fail a lot and often failing a lot and often is good you know it's how you figure out what works for you no, nobody is is going to find the formula that works for you right out of the gate that's how we learn by like failing basically so yeah mm -hmm. and there's little there's little to no downside of failing at art other than maybe, you know, your ego taking a bit of a blow. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, Do you accept short stories from other budding authors to review? I wish I had the time to do more of that. I'm better at doing reviews like portfolio redu reviews, critiques for art, uh, because it takes a little less time. Reading does take so much time. Also, I haven't been writing as long professionally as I've been working as an artist. So I don't know that I'm an especially good editor yet. I have editors for my work. I mean, my, my stuff in its raw form has so many 
many mistakes. What you're getting in book form is not all me. I think my grasp of storytelling is okay, but my grasp of structure can be a little off. That's especially something that I like to have, you know, editors and beta editors and, you know, even just fans point things out to me. My abuse of the semicolon is well known. <laughs> so, so Actually, I, I think I've noticed this actually. Yeah. <laughs> Where can we find your work, websites and social media and things? I wish I had more places to send you, but the best place to find my work is on my Twitter. If you want to see my, my free stuff or my FA, I have a lot of my books and comics and stuff are up there for free. A lot of it is the raw versions that haven't been hit with the editors yet. So at your own risk, <laughs> but if you'd like to support me, Patreon is a really good place to do so. I have like a $2 tier that gets you access to a ton of stuff. I have so much content on my Patreon. It's ridiculous at this point. That's also where I premiere like uh, my new books and stuff like all of Kindred is up on Patreon right now if you oh, want to okay. read a new book from me so. and in fact I think the tiers are what two three and five so even if you wanted to go hardcore you don't even have to pay that much <laughs> there there are hardcore tiers but they're for like commissions there's one where you get like a book and a bunch of prints every month those are more tiers for people who want to get stuff Fur planet carries all of my my books mm -hmm. um, there's a whole section there specifically for Red Lantern that has uh, the chronological listing, which is something we should have done a long time ago because people have been asking about it for ages. So if you want to read the books in order, in chronological order, now you can just go to the Fur Planet site and see what order to read them in. I will have nice. to do that. I'm so bad with getting things not in the right order. I obsess over trying to make sure I get things in the right order. And I think I've been good so far with the things I've read. But <laughs> as I say, it hasn't been much. So maybe I haven't been that lucky. I've just I haven't done much. I don't know. The Red Lantern novels are meant to be read in any order. I mean, obviously, you don't want to read like the Off the Beaten Path series out of order. You'll be very confused. You can read Off the Beaten Path and you can read Legacy and you can read Heretic and Kindred and the Red Lantern comic. You can read all of those in whatever order you want. And they all kind of funnel back into the main series. They're all part of the same world. But knowing the chronology is not important to each story. I see. The books will explain things from other books, partially as a refresher, if you've already read them. It's a lot of characters, there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, but also because, yeah, a lot of people like will just start on Off the Beaten Path, or I've had, I had a ton of people start on Kindred, and Kindred is chronologically is right in the middle somewhere, so. Before we end our time with you, thanks again for coming on our show, but is there no anything problem. else that you want to really share with the, the fandom? Get your word out there, get your message out, anything at all. Now's a, a really rough time for everybody. My brother and one of my partners both work in the hospital system, in the, in the medical system. I just wanted to say to everybody that I think this fandom is a good refuge right now. And I, I want to remind people to try and keep it a positive one because there's a, a lot of us doing much more difficult jobs than I do. They need a, a place to be mentally when they come home from work or they come home from the public sphere. There's a lot of negativity out there. Try and keep your sphere as positive and supportive as you can. I know that's hard right now. Everyone's stretched really thin. Everyone's tolerance levels are really low. The only way we're going to get through all of this is if we are there for one another in as much of a way as we can bear to be. Just keep, try and keep furry positive and try and keep furry inclusive, especially right now. I agree 100%. I agree. And remember to, we're a family, so let's be each other's support. That's what we're here for. If somebody is irritating you or something like that, just remember that it's possible that they're, they're dealing with something really difficult right now. I have to remind myself of that pretty often. So yeah, that, that, that would be my main message is just try the, the best you can to stay as, as supportive as possible. I know it's hard. I'm not saying that it's easy. Good words to, to hear. It's a common thread we're finding as we do these podcasts. And we ask that question, you're like the fourth person that's put those kind of words out into the world. And I think that's important for those words to get out into the world so that we can, as a fandom, really support each other and be supportive of those that are in our lives that aren't necessarily part of the fandom. It's been really great having you on the show. Um, you're definitely, for sure, one of my favorite, well, I haven't read much, of course, but definitely one of my favorite writers and definitely one of my favorite furry artists. So it's just been a pleasure to have you on the show. And I thank you so much for agreeing to talk with us today. Thank you so much for having uh, me on. It's been an honor. 
Wow, that was really fun to talk to Rukas. She's quite interesting. She's amazing. Yeah, she's very talented. Fun to talk to. You know, I see her, you know, at cons and, and everything. Well, as I said, buy stuff from her all the time. And, and yeah, no, she's great. I, I'm, I'm really glad she came on the show. I kind of chuckled when she said that she hides her badge when she goes out in public. Out oh, yes. Cons. So let us get to Furries in the News. In the news, not the muse. Some of them are, though, because some of them are kitties. You know, as as you do and I do, we both have little f- news feeds for furry stuff. And this popped up in my news feed, a VR furry dance. VR dance. VR dance. Yes, it's a VR furry dance. And it lets you dance with VR anime girl furries. Oh. And it's from it's from WTF Games. Uh, WTF probably stands for What the Fluff. I'm pretty sure it does. And from their little site, it says, Hours and hours of dancing in VR with female-centric furries. Hmm. Really? I'm sure that you could probably make the females look male if you wanted, if you were a female furry and didn't want to dance with other females. Or if you were a male that wanted to dance with other males. The write-up, the review said, The game makes some pretty hefty promises, saying it includes several interesting dance locations and countless, countless, mind you, countless. Countless, countless. Cool and sexy dance moves. Oh. Amazing sweet background music. And most importantly, yeah. hours of unlimited dancing. Wow. Yeah. So if this is your thing, check it out and let us know. Because I don't do VR games. I don't think you do either, Tabin. Do you? I'm trying to actually get into a VR chat. I have a VR chat account. I'm working on making my own avatar so that I can participate in VR chat. When you get that all going, you'll have to uh, tell our five listeners what that's <laughs> all about. I-, I will. I will. I will. If VR gaming is your thing... <laughs> Check out VR Furry Dance and uh, let us know what you think uh, through the emails at barelyfurcasting at gmail.com and we'll read your reviews on our podcast. And I think I'll probably check out their website in the meantime. All right. So, Tabin, do we have a math thing this week we do have a math thing this week well you might remember there were several i forget how many but several weeks ago i talked about this thing called for maps last theorem i want to talk about something similar so this actually has to do with prime numbers and barely do you remember what a prime number is something that orders from amazon It definitely does order from Amazon and you get it really quickly. Mm -hmm. Also, prime number is positive integer that its only divisors are itself and one. So for example, the number two is a prime number because one and two are the only numbers that divide it. The number three is a prime number because one and three are the only numbers that divide it. The number four is not a prime number because, well, one and four, of course, divide it, but two also divides it. So since there's a number... That's not itself or the number one. It's not a prime number. The number nine is not a prime number because three divides it. So not all odd numbers are prime. Prime numbers are actually pretty easy to understand. They're integers. And there's this big theorem that says that any integer can actually be written as a product, that is you multiply, Mm -hmm. of prime number. Prime numbers form kind of a foundation of all integers, right? I mean, because any integer can be written as prime numbers and all that stuff. Now, integers are like, they're the basis really of of everything, of science, of... I mean, they're the fundamental kind of numbers and everything comes from numbers in some way, right? So prime numbers are really important. And so it's not a surprise that people have been studying prime numbers for centuries, their properties. And it turns out there's a lot that's not known about them. For example, we don't really know the distribution. Like, is there a pattern in the prime numbers? We haven't found any. They look like they're totally randomly spread out. And we know some things about it, but really we don't have a good handle on it. Well, why do we care? Well, for example, I mean, prime numbers, they make up all the integers and universe and everything. So one application of the prime numbers is cryptology and data encryption. Turns out that data encryption algorithm are based on the prime numbers. One of the algorithms is basically actually easy in that it's based on you take a big, huge number that is the product of two prime numbers. So that is this big number just comes from multiplying two prime numbers together. 
And that's all it is. If you can find those two prime numbers that makes up that big number, then you've actually broken the data encryption algorithm. Okay, so there's this guy. Well, there was this guy, Bernard Riemann. So Riemann is known to be one of the greatest mathematicians ever. In 1859, he wrote this paper. He was exploring a lot of the prime numbers and stuff and came up with a lot of good stuff and everything. As kind of a side note, he made this conjecture about this thing called the zeta function. And don't worry about what that is, but it, it's this thing called the zeta function that doesn't look like it has anything to do with the prime numbers. It turns out that people found out that this zeta function thingy actually does have connections to prime numbers. It turns out that because of the connection with the prime numbers, if this thing is turns out to be true, we know a lot about the distribution and patterns in the prime numbers. And so there are people out there that are like really worried that, oh, if this is found out to be true, does data encryption, like security, is there no more security? <gasps> <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. It's pretty interesting, actually. It is. That's very interesting. Do you have your stupid joke book available? I do have my stupid joke book right here. So I have this book called Funny Jokes and Foxy Riddles, and it has a whole bunch of really stupid jokes. Any fur that knows me, you know, that's kind of what I do is tell bad jokes and bad puns anyway. And for any fur that knows me, I love puns. And what I did last week was I read a page of these jokes and I had never read them before. And so I'm going to do this, that again. I'll just read the next page of jokes. So the waitress says, what would you like for dinner, sir? Customer says, a hot dog. Waitress says, with pleasure. And the customer says, no, with mustard. <laughs> <laughs> that was bad. Oh my god. Mm -hmm. So the husband says, Honey, this lettuce tastes funny. The wife says, It shouldn't. It's clean. I even washed it with soap. Oh. Okay. So the milkman says, Are you sure you want 54 quarts of milk? The lady says, Yes. My doctor told me to take a bath in milk. The milkman says, Do you want it pasteurized? The lady says, No, just up to my chin. <laughs> okay. So one more. The, the city slicker says, I saved my money and bought a farm 10 miles long and half an inch wide. The farmer says, What are you going to raise on it? The city slicker says, Spaghetti. Because it's only half an inch wide. We're gonna, you know what we're going to move on to? What are we going to move on to? We're going to move on to this or that. This or that. Our first this or that, roses or daisies. Ooh, well, daisies are cute little things. that They're daisies. I mean, the, the word daisy is just cute. But I think I'll go with roses because they're all pretty smelling and my, my fluffy nose likes to smell good. All right. So would you rather have money or or fame? Money or fame? Hmm. Well, with the muns, you can buy stuff, but with the fame, you can fame stuff. And I guess I like faming stuff, so we'll go with fame. We're going to get back to a food-based breakfast or dinner. You know, it, it just like a lot of these things depends on my mood. Uh, you know, the dinner is good stuff. Especially if it's crispy chicken and nummy nummy tot tots. Yeah, see, if it's crispy chicken, nummy nummy tot tots, going to have to go the din. Brecky, you know, but you can have some tots for brekkie too. Ooh, I do like me a good egg burrito though. So, but but I guess overall I'm going to go dinner. And this last one is one that you may have never considered before. Oh my cow. Witches or wizards? Which witch is which? Is it a wizard or a witch? I don't even know if that made any sense right now. So there it is. I think I'm going to go wizard because um, when I've played like RPG little games and stuff, I play the mages and some, and so usually the mages are called wizards. So I'll just go wizard. <laughs> Well, that brings us to the end of our podcast for today. Tabin, it's been a joy having you on the show once again, as you know, you are my co-host. And so this, this show would not be the same without you. And it wouldn't be the same without you, Barely. So thank you for having me. Well, you're quite welcome. Please reach out to us. Send us an email at barelyfurcasting.com is a site. And you can get our web our webpage there and our and our furcast there. You can go to barelyfurcasting at Gmail. You can go to tabinpup at Gmail. You can go to barelynormal at Gmail email and send us a message. You can go to Telegram and send us a message there. You can go to where else can you go? Twitter and send us a message there. Message oh, us. And, and Facebook. And Facebook. Oh yes, we have a Facebook. You know, We have all the social medias. With that, we're going to say goodbye. Thank you for listening. You will hear us all again in one week. Bark, bark.
Barely Fur Casting is an Injured Nerves studio production. It is found on all major podcast platforms and can also be listened to directly at barelyfurcasting.com. All opinions expressed here are those of Tabin and Barely, and neither received any commercial compensation for their opinions. The Furcast is recorded and edited by me, Barely Normal, also known as Mike Began. Opening interstitial and closing music by Shane Ivers through SilvermanSound.com. If you would like to send us a message, you can do so via email at barelyfurcasting at gmail.com or on Telegram chat at bfftchat. Additionally, Tabin can be reached on social media at TabinPup on YouTube and Twitter. Thanks for listening. We hope to see you back here next week.